Good evening. I'm Dr. Grace Telesco, and welcome to the Criminal Justice Forum. We're live streaming from the NSU Fischler College of Education and School of Criminal Justice YouTube channel. Each of our programs examine exciting topics in the field of criminal justice, and all of our guests bring fascinating and thought-provoking topics to life as each of our educational programs bridge the gap between theory and practice. Welcome to the Criminal Justice Forum. Good evening, everyone. Dr. Telesco here, Grace Telesco, Fischler College of Education School of Criminal Justice. And I'm so excited about my guest tonight, Dr. Vincent Van Hasselt. And I'm going to read a little bit about, about him uh, if you guys don't mind. Uh, and then he's also going to have an opportunity to share with us, you know, his background, a little bit about him. Um, so Dr. Van Hassel is a president's distinguished professor and a professor of psychology at Nova Southeastern University. He's the director of the first responder research and training program. And his area of specialization is first responder psychology, focusing on the challenges and the problems of police, firefighters, emergency communication operators, and crime scene investigators. Much of Dr. Van Hasselt's research has involved collaborations with the FBI's Crisis Negotiation and Behavioral Science Unit. And he's the co-developer of the FBI's Global Hostage Taking Research and Analysis Project, studying the motivations and tactics of hostage takers internationally. He has a very long bio and um, I'm just going to ask him to please come on. Please help me welcome Dr. Van Hasselt. He's going to tell you himself about all of his background and some of the things that um, that he's been involved in. Dr. Van Hasselt, it's a joy to have you tonight. Um, and this is I was saying before we went live that this is our third collaboration. And I hope it's, um, you know, the third of many, many, many more to come. Uh, so please tell us. A little bit about yourself, a little bit about your background, and uh, for our viewers, I'm going to spotlight you right now. Great. Well, first of all, thank you, Dr. Telesco, for inviting me to be here tonight. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here. Um, yes, we have we go back a ways, and we've done several <laughs> things already together, but um, this is going to be a lot of fun, and I, I think, uh, I hope, uh, helpful to students who are attending in particular. Uh, my background is as a clinical psychologist uh, for many years, I uh, received my PhD from the University of Pittsburgh in clinical psychology. Um, as Dr. Telesco mentioned, um, you know, I've been working in the first responder area for quite some time. Uh, in addition to my role at NOVA at NSU, I've also been a um, certified police officer in the state of Florida. I work as a reserve officer with the City of Plantation Police Department. Uh, been there since I got out of our police academy back in 1995. Uh, a few things that I've done for uh, the department, I've served as a road patrol officer. I've been a member of the field force unit and I helped start our what we call crisis response team, which is part hostage negotiations, uh, part critical incident stress management. And I'm the uh, clinical director of our CISM and uh, peer support teams. So at NOVA, I direct the first responder research and training program, and we provide um, uh, research and training activities across a number of different uh, first responder groups. Um, for many years, my work was exclusively with law enforcement, but I would, would repeatedly get contacted by uh, first responders from other agencies, such as fire rescue. Um, probably about six or seven years ago, I got a call from a fire chief who said, we know what you're doing with law enforcement. We have some very significant problems uh, with our people, our firefighters, fire rescue personnel with regard to depression, uh, anxiety, uh, PTSD, as well as suicide. Can you develop uh, something for us as well, which we didn't. If we have time today, I'll talk about some of that. Uh, but also, uh, we work with crime scene investigators investigators, as well as um, dispatchers, emergency communication operators. <clears throat> and what they all have in common 
uh, is considerable trauma exposure, although the nature of the trauma is much different for each of those groups. But if you look at the DSM and look at the criteria for uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, it's interesting because you have four major criteria that really fit first responder groups to a T. Uh, criterion one is uh, being directly affected by a uh, call a traumatic event, I always want to say critical incidents because that's the language we use as first responders, but direct exposure to a, a directly impacted by a critical incident or trauma, uh, sec which is police and firefighters, certainly. Uh, the second criterion is um, witnessing something happening to other people. That's very bad. Well, police firefighters do that as well. They see quite a bit of uh, you know, very violent activities that are very traumatic in nature. And even as a reserve, I've had exposure to many of those things too. Third criterion is um, hearing from another person. They Now the DSM says family member or close friend. You know, if you're sitting as a police dispatcher or fire for rescue dispatcher and day after day, hour after hour, you're hearing from people on their worst days, having their worst experience, to me, that's pretty close to fitting that criterion. So they're they're hearing about something very bad from somebody else. And then the fourth criterion is spending an excessive amount of time dealing with the horrific aftermath of things that happen. Well, if anybody's familiar with what crime scene investigators do, that's their job. They'll spend much more time at, let's say, a homicide investigation uh, than the homicide detectives typically do. All right. And uh, the other key is that at least a few of these groups have gotten very little attention, particularly dispatchers and uh, crime scene investigators in, uh, from mental health. Uh, but anyway, uh, that's been the work that I've been involved with for uh, many years. Uh, my students are very involved um, doing a number of trainings, which I think we'll probably talk about shortly, uh, particularly, particularly in the area of behavioral health and peer support. Uh, and I see my job at NOVA for the most part now um, as providing opportunities for students to get involved in this so that when they come out, uh, when they graduate, they can work, uh, they're ready to go with uh, first responder agencies. And if we have time, I can talk about some of the, you know, we have some very successful students at the federal, state, and local levels working with a number of agencies because they've come out of our program with considerable experience. Yes. I don't know if that answers the question. I don't want to go too much at length about myself, but, uh, you know, it's been an exciting time. I just want to say up front, because when people hear, well, I'm a psychologist and a uh, police officer, well, that gives me a certain edge in my work, you know, some op open some doors that otherwise might not be open, which is probably true to a point. Um, but I just want to make sure and, and clarify, because I don't want to discourage anybody, you do not have to be a police officer or firefighter to work effectively with them from a mental health standpoint. And if we have some time today, depending on what we get through, we can discuss that further. Yeah. Uh, but you certainly have to get, you, there are ways that you have to, the time you have to put into it to get experience with the different groups, if you want to be accepted and want to be effective. Yeah. And you say, you know, you use the, the terms accepted and effective and you know there's something about us as police police officers and i always say i still call myself that because uh you know you could take the kid out of uh the police department but you can't take the police department out of the kid right. um so like i still identify uh that way i i still walk in the world that way uh even though it's been a lot of years ago, you know, decades, decades ago. But you you mentioned acceptance and effectiveness. So what is it about, I want to say, us, police, law enforcement, uh, first responders, that that makes us sort of unique that we that we are, I don't want to say paranoid, although I am. But I am what too. Is, I okay. So what is it, what is it about us that we as a group, uh, don't trust any outsiders. And so yeah. that's the acceptance part. And then I'll get to effective after you, yeah. after you're yeah. done. I think that's a good, that's a terrific question. You know, there's always been, um, well, at least historically, I think it's starting to change a bit now, but you know, an us versus them mentality, you know, very much circling the wagons, you know, we won't let outsiders in for a number of reasons. And one of the, the big reasons, as you know, Dr. Telesco is the culture. You know, first responder culture dictates that, you know, we handle our issues and problems ourselves. We don't go to outsiders, even if we think we need to. We're very reluctant because the culture says that we're supposed to be the, you know, the strong ones. And if we go for outside help, maybe we'll be considered the weak link. 
Uh, maybe our coworkers or buddies will think that we're not really up to doing the job and that, you know, they won't be able to back us up effectively or, or be very good at, on the job if, uh, you know, they're perceived as being weak somehow from a mental health standpoint. So there's been a great reluctance um, over the years for all first responders to go for help and even in cases where they need it. Um, I think that's starting to change and you know, it takes a lot of education and we'll probably talk about this later too. Uh, you know, it takes um, good administrators, you know, to really, you know, it, it starts from the top. They have to support these sorts of changes. Uh, some are very supportive and I have been fortunate to work with many of them. Some talk a good game, but don't really, you know, they're not really believing it. And you can see through that pretty quickly. Then you have the old school traditional, you know, thinking that, well, despite what awful thing you went through today, if you can't get back on the road, you, you're no good to me kind of mentality. And uh, so you still have that. And we know that, you know, there are ways to prevent uh, trauma responses, you know, mental health is pretty well, you know, we, we've learned a lot over the years. And, you know, there is some research with first responders, but it's not considerable. It's not very expansive. Uh, it's still very hard to get um, first responders to participate in research, despite the fact that projects are confidential, anonymous, you know, we're doing everything, but, you know, ask them to wear gloves so there are no fingerprints left on something that they fill out. <laughs> you know, I, I will yeah. tell you a funny story, Dr. Telesco. And when I first, I think one of the very first research projects I did, this is over 25 years ago, I had the opportunity to do an assessment of uh, depression and uh, hopelessness. And you may be familiar with the scales. I know psychology students are uh, Beck Depression Inventory and the Beck Hopelessness Scale. There are screening tools, which means they're pretty face valid. I, you know, we, we all know that, but they're still used quite a bit in research. So I had the opportunity to administer that to about 50 police officers in one group one time with an agency that's local. And what did you know if they're the healthiest darn bunch of cops you ever saw? Every one of them scored zero. Mm. Zero. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which just, you know, that's, that's impossible. You know, nobody scores zero on these things. You know, the healthiest person on the planet is going to have a, you know, have some points there, but you know what that's about. Yes. It's anonymous, it's confidential, but maybe somehow, in some way, this will get back or someone will look at this and put something together. And there is that paranoia. Yeah. Now, some of it, I think, is well, you know, well, you know, we can understand it. If I'm found out to seek help, well, Besides my peers being concerned, what if it goes upstairs somehow? What if it's leaked? What if I go to my EAP program and they pass the information on that I was seeking help there? Will that affect my job, my promotion possibility, you know, things I want to do in the future with special units? Will I not be trusted anymore? <clears throat> so there's a, a you know a good deal of distrust towards mental health professionals, which has been there forever. <laughs> and again, I think it's changing slowly now, but uh, it's still out there. It's still pretty significant. It's definitely out there and it and it's real. I mean, it's, yeah. uh, you know, we think about it as if, if, if you're a lieutenant or a captain and you discover that, you know, you've got one of your guys comes to you and says, I, I, I can't handle it anymore. Um, I'm, I'm so depressed. Uh, if I feel like if I were to die, that would be fine. Right. You know, is that a suicidal ideation? Um, maybe. But if I hear that and I'm a lieutenant or a captain, I, I can't just not do anything about that. I'm going to follow through. So it's it's not just a fear, but it's real. It's a real practice and a policy almost. Right. Yeah. And it really has to be a policy issue. And a good example of that. And we'll probably talk about this later. Two critical incident debriefings, uh, which are done <clears throat> following uh police participation in something that's really above and beyond even the norm for them, uh, what we define in psychology as a traumatic event, um, line of duty death, line of duty shooting, uh, anything involving a child, uh, explosions. I mean, anything that's even by their standards is above their threshold. Uh, if it's not in the SOPs, which uh, for the unacquainted uh, stands for standard operating procedure, which is these are located and written up and placed in a manual for every officer to have a, as a record. If it doesn't state that any officer or all officers involved in a critical incident are, will be mandated to attend the critic, what's called a critical incident debriefing, they're not going to go. Uh, even if they think they would benefit from it, they're afraid that if they go, because it's up to them, they're told if you want to go, you can, you don't have to go, they're not going to go. 
because uh, again, it's the issue of being viewed as the weak link and the culture says, I can, you know, I can take all this. It's not a big deal. I'm desensitized over time, which we know is not true uh, to a point it is, but, you know, it's very repressed over time. And, you know, when we get a high percentage or a high number of police officers with ulcers, migraines and cardiac problems, which we do, well, you know, that's partly due to not dealing with traumas effectively and in a healthy manner. You know, those are just, uh, very, you know, these are all what we call psychosomatic disorders, which really are at a very high level of police and firefighters and the other groups. Um, but again, the reluctance to, to seek help. Yeah, I, I do want to come back to the critical incident stress uh, debriefing piece. But I wanted to ask you this. So. It's stressful to be a police officer. We see people at their worst um, where we're constantly coming upon, you know, case after case where we see a lot of injustice in our system. Um, it, it's frustrating. We have um, maybe community unrest and community lack of support or um, perceptions of us that um, demonize us. Uh, all of these things contribute, plus the intra organizational stress. Right. Um, you know, and the paperwork and all of that stuff, which cumulatively can really impact. But you're talking about trauma. Can you yeah. can you like differentiate for us? Yeah. And uh, well, trauma, same as critical incidents, uh, anything that's above and beyond the norm. And, and let's not talk about civilians because their their standard is lower. Uh, you know, police officers and fire rescue personnel, you know, they're, you know tra a traumatic event would be something that's, you know, almost a, an outlier for them. Uh, you know, a good example, we have, unfortunately, many, you know, uh, child drownings, right? A very tra traumatic event for officers and any first responder that shows up to the scene. Uh, like I said, line of duty shooting. Anytime a police officer has to use their firearm, that's a traumatic event. Uh, especially if a coworker is uh, injured or killed, you know these are all significant traumas. And the estimate is that um, the last research I saw on this, it's that if you have a police officer with a 25-year career, which is kind of an average length, I think now, uh, they've had at least 200 critical incidents or traumatic events uh, that are significant. Uh, civilians, you know, six or eight, okay, they, they they lose loved ones occasionally, but it just doesn't compare. There's absolutely no comparison. Uh, you know, combat infantry is the closest you get to, you know, what police officers and fire rescue experience. So if you're talking on average 200 critical incidents, uh, that's an awful lot, right? Yeah. And you know, we know that, uh, you know, police officers tend to die earlier. At least the, the research is really on males, male officers. We don't unfortunately know that much about female officers. And I, my, part of my research group is starting to look at that, you know, what can we learn about them? Uh, but they usually die five to seven years on average sooner than civilian counterparts. And now a lot of that has to do with the you know, cardiovascular problems, but that, you know, they tend to be very stress related, yeah. you know, high blood pressure, high sugar, you know, uh, not exercising, you know, these sorts of things. And, uh, you know, when somebody comes out of the police academy, they're in the best shape of their lives, probably. Uh, some of them stay in great shape, but a lot of them don't. And, uh, you know, as stress accumulates and especially traumatic stress, you know, some aren't doing the things that might be in their best interest to stay healthy physically and emotionally. And often there isn't a lot of encouragement from agencies to do so anyway. We're very much available. Yeah. And quite frankly, if you're if you're you feel you have a mental health issue of concern and you're told, well, go to your EAP, well, that's not going to happen because we both know that most cops don't trust them. For okay. in many cases, good reasons. You know, first there's the confidentiality issue. I think that's mine. I don't think there's, that's really should be a legitimate concern, but that's how they view it. But the other part of it is, you know, EAP providers don't know much about the, what, you know, police and firefighters do. They don't know the job. And sometimes they say and do really stupid things, right. uh, even seasoned therapists. Uh, so then, you know, where do you go? And, you know, the function of a police psychologist, I like to expand that the first responder psychologist, is to be familiar enough with the group you're working with that you understand what they're talking about. You understand the language. You understand the calls, the signals, you know, 1065 signal, you know, 38. You know, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, they speak that language. And, um, you know, most psychologists will sit there dumbfounded, like, what did he or she say? They don't exactly. know. Right. So. Yeah. And, and, you know, as a group where we are, we do tend to be paranoid and and with some justification too. you know, I re, like I remember 
uh, toward the end of my career when 9-11 happened and I, where I was and what happened and then the rest of the work for a year and a half at Ground Zero. But I remember thinking, this is this is the end of the world. And, and you know, I've always kind of felt like this might be a hostile environment that we're all in, <laughs> this yeah. thing called the world. And, uh, yeah. and then when that happened, it was just like, yes, that just confirmed whatever feelings of fear uh, that, that you might have had within yourself. So, and you go back to the uh, early intervention piece. I think that those uh, early intervention uh, employee assistance programs, I, I have not been... Um, I have not seen effectiveness because you you mentioned earlier acceptance and effectiveness. So how can you be effective? So as a police psychologist, you you just now said, you know, they they know that you kind of get it because you are one of them. So you're yeah. you're a peer, um, you're a colleague. How can other psychologists be effective? Well, I, that's a great question. And, and let me tell you what I advise my students. In fact, I insist on if they're going to work as part of a first responder program, they need to do a few things. Uh, one is they have to be involved in, um, I think it's one of the, I think a major function of a police psychologist is to assist with hostage negotiation training. Uh, my agency, I, I serve as training coordinator for the CRT crisis response team of Plantation Police Department. And we have uh, regularly scheduled trainings third Wednesday of the month. Uh, morning is classroom didactic, afternoon uh, role play scenarios are what we like to call scenario based training. Uh, my doctoral students serve as the role players. We call this group the Nova players. Uh, we've had this going on for almost 20 years now. I can't tell you how many generations of doctoral students we've had that participated and gone on later to get jobs in this field. But that gives them an opportunity to really learn something about hostage crisis negotiations. They also get to sit down with police officers in these role play scenarios and even assist to provide feedback. So whenever we do these trainings, we could have anywhere from 60 to 100 officers sitting there and the students are sitting there with them. They get a chance to meet them. They get a chance to speak with them. They get a chance to do the role plays with them and give them feedback. So there's a lot of interaction that they have and they're able to develop uh, and friendships as well in many cases. But again, it's starting to learn something about the culture and learn something about the audience, because that's a whole other issue trying to teach and train cops and firefighters. It's not like a bunch of teaching, you know, mental health people. <laughs> They're different. Um, the other thing is I really push for my students to get um, certified in critical incident stress management, because that's something anybody can really do. It's a three day, as you know, it's a three day school. You get your certificate. That doesn't mean you're ready to, and you know, able to go and do the briefings because that's really an apprenticeship of sorts, but at least that's something you have to offer. And then, you know, whether opportunities to get students in, when I've done the briefings over the years, I really try to get some of mine to at least sit in and help with it. So that's something that's very important for first responders. And that's a skill that they can get while they're students and get experience and get exposure to these, you know, these first responders. Uh, the other thing that I, I really am impressed by, uh, several towns down here, you know, in Broward County in particular, uh, have what are called citizen police academies. And you, I don't know if they, if they do those in New York. But, yes. uh, you know, they put on, it's like I call it a law enforcement dog and pony show in a sense, mm. right? Mm. They meet for 12 weeks, one evening a week for two to three hours and different units within the agency do a presentation. You know, one week could be the homicide investigators. The next week could be the canine unit. Another week could be, you know, the VIN unit. Uh, so they get a nice, uh, a good deal of exposure to what police uh, agencies and di different units uh, do. And at the end, they're able to do ride-alongs, which, by the way, I think is crucial. You know, you, yes. you know, if you want to, you don't have to be a cop or firefighter, firefighter, but if you have opportunities to do ride-alongs and see what this job really looks like and what they have to deal with, it's not like television. And, you know, typically psychologists will see these problems, you know, if they get them at all. I think domestic violence is a good example because one of the things I do at NOVA is direct the family violence program. Well, our clinicians don't see victims, you know, with who are still bloody and, you know, bleeding and bruised and, you know, with the lacerations because they were just battered. You know, they typically see them weeks, sometimes months after the event. They don't see what this really looks like, do they? Right. You know, uh, you know they don't see what police officers are exposed to. And that's part of what, that's a big part of what they're exposed to. Uh, not that we want, you know, graduate students, you know, being pulled into crime scenes. That's not the point, but at least to see what the officers have to do going into these things. Yeah. Well, that's something students can do. Uh, and my many, many of my students do. 
So, I, you know, there are things that they can do to get experience and to actually get an understanding of the audience. So when they go on, if they're going to do clinical work, well, they know something about the profession. You know, they've spoken with them. They've sat down. They've had lunch and dinner with them. They've trained them, uh, you know, as opposed to, let's say, uh, again, I don't want to be too unfair to EAPs. A lot of them are citywide EAPs who could work with the city plumbers or the city administrative assistants. You know, it, it's kind of a generic general sort of a, a group that are not specialized at all. And yes. I, I really think that if you're going to work with police and firefighters and the other groups, you really need to know that uh, you need to know that audience. If you're going to do training, if you're going to do clinical work, otherwise, you, yeah, it's not going to go very well for you. And it's about building a rapport and it's about yes. trust and, and trusting each other. Um now, I'm going to bring up critical incident stress debriefing, and yeah. um, I've done a lot of research on this uh, in terms of reading, reading the literature, right? Empirical literature, not that I've conducted the research, but I, and I know that it's effective and I know that that's what the research shows us. Anecdotally, however, uh, can I tell you a horror story? Yeah. And, I, you know, so you, when you hear this, you're going to assess this and you're going to go, oh, my God, worst thing you could do. Isn't it true that according to the well, the Mitchell model that you you should be doing this within the first 24, 48 hours? Am I right? Well, that's what the book says, but I can talk to you about that after your story. OK, but it's so, not always, so, you can't always do that. Yeah. OK, that's uh, granted. Um, what about two weeks later? Well, it's interesting. And you ask that because uh, after the surf site collapse, we had uh, a number of mental health people, including myself, had a, had a, a, had a Zoom conference call with Jeff Mitchell. And, you know, he's one of the co-developers of the model. And our question was this, and I, it may be related to what I think you're about to say. You have urban search and rescue people going through the piles with buckets looking for parts, right, body parts. They're in the middle of their job, much like 9-11. That went on for months. So does it make any sense? And the answer, of course, is no. To try to do debriefings or any real psychological intervention at that point while they're still working. Right. But the concern was just that. Well, you know, the, the book on this says, well, you're supposed to do them within 24 to 48 hours at the utmost 72 hours. But it just doesn't make sense when you have a, an extended long term event like that. Right. Um, and I, and I, I kind of guess what Jeff was going to say. And I, he was right. He said, look, don't get so tied up with this interval thing. Uh, if you have to wait a month or more, better you do them than not. And if you try to approach people who are in the middle of their job doing something that's a very difficult, challenging, and uh, stressful job, and try to catch them for a debriefing, it's not going to go well. No, and this and ours didn't go well. So we, besides the fact that it was two weeks after nine eleven, um, because every day we were working and it was fourteen hour days, yeah. and by the time in in the morning, in the morning at like. Uh, 0400 or 0500 hours we would assemble and um, and I would do a little check in with them with my with my with my cops with my cops and sergeants just to check in you know go around who wants to who wants to say what's going on how they're feeling fine and that was I think that that was somewhat effective and it made them at least feel heard and it got them a chance to ventilate and and say what was going on well, at the end of the tour this one day, I'm, and I'm talking 14 hour tour We're we're at the end, they're ready to be dismissed. And it was almost like a hijack. They literally and I say they because I don't even know who it was. I want to I want to say it might have been Papa, which is a peer support group uh, that we have in, in the in the police department and NYPD. That's what it's called. Papa, it's peer support. Uh, and they come from all over the country. That's not just New York specific. And they put us in vans. They brought us back to <laughs> look at your face. They 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 put us in vans. They don't tell us where we're going. They don't tell us what's happening. I'm asking. I'm, I'm the lieutenant and I'm asking what what what's happening to my guys? What, why are we doing this? And they're not giving me an answer. And we get down to they transport us all the way back to ground zero ish area and we go upstairs and i'm thinking this is like a hostage situation like what are, what's happening here and they split us up into these small groups and it was horrific and i believe damaging what do you 
when you hear the story, and I'm sure I'm not the only story that you've heard like that. Um, but that to me was a critical incident, stress debriefing gone bad. What do you what do you think? Yeah, well, so they broke broke you up into different groups to do the briefings. Was that yes? Yeah. And and that was very upsetting to people because they wanted to be together as as sure. this one group. Oh, and yeah. yeah. Well, that's awful. And that's, you know, whoever planned that one doesn't know what in the world they're doing. Uh, and yeah, I think that could be damaging. You know, plus they're so involved in the work, you know, the timing just isn't right. There's not much point. They're better off if you're a mental health person in a situation, you offer them a bottle or two of water. That's what they need. <laughs> you know, they don't right. need a debriefing at that point. Exactly. Uh, and, and you probably know this person. I have the book here. I should have if I can find it quickly, it was written by, um, I guess, one of the chiefs or someone with the New York uh, Port Authority police who was overseeing, I think, the midnight shift. Uh, you probably know, I'm sure you know him. Yes. Uh, it was a terrific book about that, but he had, a, he had a passage in there where he was very critical of the mental health people that showed up. Yes. He basically said, well, they're wearing, you know, critical incident debriefing jackets, and they're running around trying to, you know, snap up fire rescue and I guess the iron workers and anybody they could to do a debriefing with them. And he thought that was just ridiculous. And I, I don't know if they probably banned them eventually, but you know, this to me, the stupidity of that, you know, how you know what what are you know what are they thinking? Right. And obviously they're not thinking correctly. So I don't know if they're trying just to you know pad their vita with saying that they showed up there and they did something. If they really think they're being effective, which that's scarier yet, uh, but that's just very wrong. And if you know really anything about A, the audience, and B, how to do these things, because you can't always follow the book, by the way, you know, even with the steps. And, you know, Jeff Mitchell will say that he'll tell you the same thing. Uh, you know, that's why you can't just have someone who gets their certificate run out and start to do these things. It's kind of like an apprenticeship. They have to sit in with people who have. Because uh, I think most of the time over the past several years that we've done these with our uh, plantation CRT team who have gone out to assist other agencies, because we have a lot of AOAs, you know, that, you know, assist other agencies when they have things, uh, you know, we have to modify it, you know, based on what we have there. Right. Uh, but we're certainly not going to go and run and do something while they're in the middle of their jobs. So I think the answer to the original question, well, and Jeff Mitchell did answer it. Don't be so tied to this time frame necessarily. You have to use some good judgment. Yes. And I don't think that judgment was used in that in that case yeah. at all. Uh, and then um, another personal story. I'm deployed after I retire to New Orleans after Katrina uh, to help assist in debriefing the New Orleans Police Department. I'm the only one on the team. Everyone else is from um, various offices of mental health and state offices of mel mental health. I'm the only cop there, a former, former cop. I really thought we talk about effectiveness that that they would open up and they didn't and they wouldn't not in that setting. But after it was over in the lobby by the elevator. The conversation was amazing. Yeah. And I was able to listen, provide some validation, all of that. But um, in the formal setting, they were shut down. In the informal setting, they opened up. What do you, what do you think about that? Yeah, well, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> and this is, might sound a little funny, but we learned years ago that when we do these debriefings, we try to schedule them not too far from lunch or dinner time, and we order pizzas pizzas and sodas or coffee, uh, because just like you say, people may not be too participatory during the group itself for a number of reasons. They feel uncomfortable or self-conscious about it. But hey, you'd be amazed at what we hear once, you know, we're all standing around later talking over pizza and, and uh, soda. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, and I think as much as anything, I mean, I'm a very strong believer in the briefings, um, but I think a very important part, well, two things, a few things. One is that I think a real plus is you have a, a kind of a built-in social support system there, right? And you have only those people directly involved in this incident, uh, but they're their own little group, right? So you have, you know, because we know the importance of social support and have opportunities to share about, you know, shared experiences, uh, whether it be in uh, the briefings. I, you know, I never get that, uh, you know, concerned if people aren't participating. We try to encourage them. We try to keep it, you know, very open. Um, but, 
if I think as important is to follow up with people and our policy, at least with my agency has always been my team, has been to contact people a week, two weeks, maybe three weeks or more afterwards and see how they're doing. All right. Yeah. Yeah. You can't just do, I don't, I don't think, you can't just do the debriefing and think you have it covered, right? As important as anything, and uh, Mitchell and Everly will tell you the same thing, uh, is the follow-up and where necessary, maybe family support also, right? Yes. Uh, but that's rarely done. And a lot of uh, administrators think, well, we're doing debriefings. We've got it covered, right? Therefore, that's what we need. And that's not true. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Telesco, I'll tell you a funny story. Um, this is uh, shortly before the pandemic, I was invited to speak to a group of police and fire rescue administrators, big group. And I was talking about trauma response and first responders. And I said, you know, how many of you have uh, CIS trained SISM teams in your agency? Well, most of the hands go up. Great. All right. How many of you have some kind of educational program, even brief, but like a let's call it behavioral health training, that you can educate your people as to, you know, signs and symptoms, things to look out for, right, just in the course of your career, that that's something you offer periodically. I call them the big six problems, if we have time, we can get into that. Well, a few hands went up, but not very many. How many of you have peer support programs so that, you know, an officer, a firefighter who may be having a problem, but reluctant to go to EAP or to a mental health professional, at least initially, can, um, you know, would have somebody to speak with that they trust. Well, I said, uh, there are probably 100, 100 people in that audience, maybe two hands went up at that point, maybe three, I can't remember. How many of you have um, a list of vetted resources that you can send people to in the event that they really need some, some further psychological counseling or treatment or even medication in some extreme cases, but you know that they're trusted that we know people who have gone to them and they have familiarity working with first responders. So, you know, they, they know something about the audience. No hand went up. Well, they will have EAP, so they think they have that in cover too. So I don't think I'm going to be invited back to that group, Dr. Telesco, yeah. because I said, you guys, <laughs> I said, you guys are missing the boat. You can't, yeah. you know, it's like a four-legged table. You totally. Need, yeah, four, all four of those legs have to be, you know, you have to have them. You pull one off, well, it's going to be wobbly. You pull two off, the thing collapses. Yes, yes. You know, and that's really what it takes. Absolutely. And it takes a lot of effort. But, you know, that's how you prevent, you know, significant mental health issues and things like suicide. Right. And suicide is uh, is among one of one of the biggest uh, issues for us, isn't, isn't it? Yeah. You know, the problem is, you know, it's always been felt that, well, the suicide rate for law enforcement is higher than civilians, which it probably is. Uh, and we know that on average, twice as many officers kill themselves than are killed in the line of duty. We know that. But the truth is, there's no central repository for data on police suicides, right? Uh, nobody collects that. You know, the FBI for years has had their publication killed in the line of duty. You probably have seen that, you know, that the old behavioral science unit used to put out. But there's nothing comparable on police suicides. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, you know, uh, you have uh, Blue Health, you have Badge of Courage, you have PAPA, you know, have you have sort of organizations that function outside of agencies where a lot of this information comes from. But there's no central way, central what's called a repository of data on police suicides. Yes. So we're we're kind of guessing about this. And as you know, you know, some not that you know they're not covering this up necessarily, but a lot of this doesn't make it to the media, right? So how do you really have an accurate estimate? You really don't, although we know that it's a, a real high risk group for a number of mental health problems. Yes. And let me just say, I, you know, I referred to the big six earlier, and these are things that we target when we do our behavioral health and peer support trainings. Uh, big six meaning these are major mental health issues that based on the research and based on my experience working for years in private practice and in different trainings with these groups, I found them to be most significant. Anxiety, depression, substance use or abuse, sleep problems, PTSD, and suicide risk, big six. Now, cutting across all of those uh, is the problem of relationship conflicts. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if you look at the research on suicides, and there's a very a terrific researcher, Dr. John Violanti, who's looked at police suicides for years. I'm sure you're familiar with him. Um, you know, he was cited in that Police Executive Research Forum uh, publication as saying that that's probably the most important precursor to actual suicides is relationship conflict, mm. right? 
but you know that's typically typically combined with some combination of the the big six that I'm talking about. Yes. Uh, so when we're doing peer support training, you know, we train our peer support people who are going to be looking and dealing with people who might be at higher risk, uh, not to be mental health experts, but to know signs and symptoms of the big six. You know, what are the indicators? What are the risk factors, uh, especially for suicide? You know, what what are the what are the signs of these kinds of things that so they can detect if someone's having problems, even if that person doesn't come to them, they can go to that person. Because uh, it's, you know, the old story, but, you know, uh, see something, say something. Mm. And uh, we both know, I'm sure a lot of stories where, you know, people knew that they had a risky coworker, but they are, for many reasons, didn't say anything about them. And the person ended up either, you know, medical doubt or suicide in some cases. Right. And people right. knew. It's, in most cases, it's not like, well, boy, that's a total shock. I didn't know that Joe or Gene would have was in such bad shape. Yes. No, no, they, they know something's not right because they, in many cases, they see them more than their families, especially right. ones that work details and the firefighters who work together for 48 or 72 hours together. But yeah. why are they not saying anything? Well, we know. I mean, they don't want to, you know, rat out their partner. They're afraid they'll get them in trouble. You know, it's, you know, uh, there's a whole laundry list of those sorts of things. Now, the advantage of peer support, they're trained to look for these things and they're sort of that initial, you know, they're the, first line of defense in a sense aren't they yes because you know who's who's a cop going to talk to first the eap person or some psychologist or psychiatrist or a peer in many cases they may not talk to anyone but if they're going to talk to anyone at all it's going to probably be a peer first it's going to be a peer it might be their sergeant if they have a good rapport it might be a chaplain it might be a fraternal organization you know um and what I mean by fraternal organization is, uh, you know, like the Columbia Association, the um, the Emeralds. Uh, these are, you know, they like um, ethnic ethnic relationships, uh, right. people right. that, you know, and that you can get along with, uh, et cetera. But I want to go back to something that you mentioned. And I'm so glad that you mentioned this, the, the big six. And I definitely want to come back to that in terms of substance abuse. What do you think about the, the notion of trauma bonding around uh, a traumatic event, uh, a 9-11, um, a Parkland, a Surfside, what, whatever it is that's happening, these traumatic events where we have something in common and only yeah. we can understand it. It's beyond us versus them. I believe it's trauma bonding. What do you what do you think about that? Yeah, uh, well, you know, it's. Kind of like the focus of uh, critical incident debriefings, in a sense, they're kind of mini trauma bondings. If you know, usually, they're not a, typically as, for as big a group as the incidents that you talked about. And by the way, I was involved with doing the briefings and those things that you mentioned. Um, I, I don't know why I don't like the term trauma bonding. I just would prefer probably social bonding or social support network building, you know, something like that. Uh-huh. Uh, I think the downside might be, well, they yes, they have, all have this experience in common and they talk about themselves. Can that, you know, lead to kind of a circle of the wagon? Well, you know, we have each other, so therefore we don't need any outside help. And that probably is the case for most of them, but not all of them. So, we'll, you know, a person in that trauma bond, in a sense, be reluctant to seek outside help if they really need it. I'm not yes. sure. Yeah. Uh, okay. I, you know, I, it could be a risk. I, I, you know, we're talking about things really where there's no research to the fact that yeah. it's basically our experiences that we both right. had. In uh, you know, after Parkland, our crisis response team worked with a lot of the officers who actually went into the school, often in very large groups. And I, I thought that was helpful because there was, you know, a good deal of bonding. That, you know, they're, they're very collegial. You know, they all went through the same experience. You, of course, have to modify the briefing because you're not going to do one, you know, you can't go around the room, right, and ask about the seven steps. Uh, but you can, you know, it still, I think, can be a very good experience. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, it's like, you know, like any of these techniques, you have to know what you're doing. You have to have some experience, especially for the big events. Uh, yeah. And so you- I mean, there, yeah, there has to be trust. I mean, I think it's right. hard in some of those big cases for outside people not outside law enforcement, for example, our, our crisis response team that CISM trained, you know, we were very easily accepted to other law enforcement agencies that were involved in Parkland. There was no issue about that. Um, 
I think if you tried to, and you know, fortunately, I, yes, I'm a psychologist. Uh, it probably was a big advantage to also be able to be introduced as a certified police officer, yeah, right? Exactly. Uh, yes. If I was, yeah, if I was just a psychologist, I'm not sure how well I would have gone. Exactly. I mean, you, but you have that kind of you have that kind of really cool vibe going there. So even if uh, maybe maybe you would be one of those that we just loved anyway, uh, possibly. Yeah. <laughs> it, it could be. <laughs> yeah. But I'll tell you a funny story, Dr. Telesco. When I was doing private practice, I'd get phone calls, you know, from police officers, mainly police officers. It'd be one of two things. Uh, my buddy has a problem, but he's a little reluctant. He's reluctant to come and see you, or she's reluctant to come and see you. Uh, you know what can we do? Now, you know, most of the time I knew it wasn't the buddy, correct? You know, you know right. That's the but in some cases it was. So I like the joke I had. In addition to my regular office, I had two other officers. Uh, offices. One was Lester's Diner East. I don't know if you're familiar with Lester's. Out sure. In the 80s. Yes. And. Uh, <laughs> Which was the better of the two? Lester's West had uh, the re- hours were restricted, but Lester's East was 24 hours. Uh-huh. So I would say, well, bring your buddy. I'll meet for coffee. You name the time. We'll meet at Lester's Diner. I don't care if it's three in the morning if they're coming off midnight shift. When, you know, you, you tell me when you want to meet, um, and I'll be there. And uh, if your buddy, you know, feels comfortable, you know, talking again after that, then we'll meet in the office. If not, then they don't have to come at all. But yeah, uh, let's just go for coffee. And I'll tell you, at least nine plus out of ten times, it wasn't an issue after that, right? Yeah, half, that's the, great. half the time it wasn't the buddy; it was them anyway. Sometimes it wasn't exactly. the buddy, right? Right. Uh, but you know, <laughs> you have to be flexible, and you have to be creative. I think. Uh, yes. Hope that's considered creative, and you have to know your audience. You know, that's what I call it. Yes. You know, yes. You probably have seen this too. You have some academic type who's probably, you know, very well established and maybe an expert in their field, uh, but they don't know, you know, then they teach or train law enforcement in whatever topic is it is. And I can tell you some horror stories that I witnessed that involve some very, very well known mental health people, but, you know, they're used to going to an APA conference where everybody sits there politely, no matter what they say and how, you know, boring it is and how they're bored, you know, PowerPoint slide after slide. No. Uh, and they really, it didn't go well. You know, you yeah. need to know that, you know, first responders, first of all, that you don't throw a lot of data at them. Don't hit them with a bunch of PowerPoint slides and don't get over, don't be condescending whenever or come off that way. Absolutely. They need something that they can use for their jobs, right? Exactly. They need yes. something that it's going to help them you know, that yes. they can take away and say, oh, well, I really got something out of this today that I can use for either myself or for what I do. Right. If you don't offer that, boy, it's going to be a long training session. Yeah, exactly right. Um, right. I know that we have a lot of questions. There's a lot of people, including someone who you, I think, you know, Dr. Kimberly Durham. Right? Oh, uh-huh. sure. Uh-huh. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Uh, so um, the dean has been asking some questions and I'd like to get to them. Um I don't think we have enough time maybe to talk about what we were talking about before um, before the show started, which was about substance abuse and and pain medication. Um, Right. Yeah. You know, this this was a big problem in the NYPD. There were people who were getting into car accidents. There were people who were injured on the line of duty in the line of duty being prescribed pain medicine and then self-medicating. Uh, as a you know, because of untreated uh, mental mental health issues, whatever they might be, relationship conflict, um, stress, PTSD, all of the things that you were mentioning before, and so the self medication began, the numbing began, and then right. now the addiction began. So, I mean, do you are you seeing this um, less less and less, or more and more? You know, I, I'm i still seeing a lot of alcohol abuse, you know, and that's the one they can use and not get fired, right? Right. They can drink like a fish, you know, but if they take something else that's, you know, if they smoke uh, marijuana and that comes up positive, they're out of a job. Yes. Uh, I, I don't see a lot of it, but, you know, I'm not, you know, I know it's certainly out there. I think it's easier to cover up to a point unless it, you know, gets so out of control because part of it is you build up a tolerance. So they may not look too much different, but they're taking more of it because they need to until something bad happens. Like you say, they have a traffic crash or, or something bad happens. And lo and behold, this stuff shows up in their system. 
I have a great video about this at some point I'll share with you that it's uh, an officer up north who had a, a terrible uh, addiction to oxy. He, he did end up losing his job, but, uh, you know, he sort of he turned his life around. It was more than just a job, though, at that point. It was, you know, he was about to he could have lost his life or killed somebody else. So, you know, these are very serious addictions. I just personally have not seen much of that. I, we know it's out there. And, and let's not forget about steroid use as well. Yes, yes. Most of the agencies that will do drug testing, they tend not to test for steroids. Right, but, right. You know, there are kinds of problems with them too. Yes, yes. So unfortunately, I mean, this, we, I think before the show, we were saying that we could go for like months or years talking tonight, but yeah. um, I do want to open it up now to, uh, to some questions, if that's all right with you. And then you'll sure. have a chance for like, you know, last, last words. Yeah. Um, now, let me, let me read you both of the Dean's questions. The first question is given today's climate, and we and we we know what that is. Let's let's just say it um, right out there. I mean, um, a lot of the actions that we're seeing that police officers are doing, you know, look, frankly, they're they're criminal. And I don't consider them them to be police officers. I, I feel that they are criminals in a police uh, kind of outfit. Um, but we've been demonized a lot and a lot of community um, mistrust, et cetera. So that's the climate I believe she's talking about. What would you say to those who want to become a police officer? Is it worth it? And then especially in light of the background of this show, which is about the risks and the mental health risks and right. outcomes. Right. Well, the mental health risk has always been there, always will be. I mean, there's no getting around that. However, if you have some smart programs that are built into an agency that are more preventive in nature, you, I think you can offset a lot of that. Uh, yeah, I think there are really three parts to this, you know, when it comes to, you know, how officers function. And uh, you have much more experience in this than I do. But uh, screening of candidates, training and supervision, right? And I think where they're having these very unfortunate and very bad actors who have been in the job and done some horrendous things, um, you can fault, you know, that, well, the train, it must be something wrong with training and supervision because these kind of things shouldn't happen. Uh, and psychologists don't like to hear this, but, you know, who does the initial screening for police candidates? Oh, well, it's the psychologist, right? They yes. do a, a very extensive battery between, you know, psychological testing and interviewing. Now, you know, we can't expect expect that that's going to be a perfect science necessarily, but gee, wouldn't we hope that, you know, people who should not be in the field uh, wouldn't get in the field and that we could screen them out? Yes. Well, obviously it's not a perfect science because some people are getting through. Right. Now, as you know, we expect a lot of police officers, and I like to use the example because these are experiences I've had. You have to be able to respond well to the little boy who falls off his bicycle and skins his knee while you're driving your police car by and you stop to make sure he's okay and attend to him or her, right? And deal also with the batterer who's, you know, beating his wife when you get there and who's in such a rage that it takes three people, three cops to pull him off. It's the same officer. I mean, people have to have what I call a wide range of cognitive and behavioral, uh, behavioral and affective responses. And, Boy, that's, a, that's asking a lot. Yeah, right? it is. It is asking a lot. It's about 20 jobs in one person. Right, right. And not to mention, you know, the complaint has always been, well, you're asking us to be social workers at the same time. Now, that's changing a, a little bit with the, the notion of co-responder teams. And, you know, BSO and a lot of agencies are starting to do this now, where if you have a, what sounds like a seriously mentally ill person, what we call in Broward County as Signal 20, uh, you send a, a deputy or a police officer with a trained mental health professional as a pair. Uh, so you have some case management and some good assessment done on the spot that's handled by the mental health clinician. And you have the deputy or police officer there for the sake of safety. If, 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 if an arrest would have to be made or someone taken into custody. Right. Uh, I think, you know, those kind of approaches are very helpful uh, for everybody, including the officer. But it's you know, uh, one funny thing. I don't know if you heard this and I don't know his name, but. Um, one of the administrators for the National uh, Fraternal Order of Police some months ago was being interviewed. And uh, the interviewer said, well, what do you say to a young person who wants to be a police officer these days, given all of the things, Dr. Telesco, you just mentioned, with all that's going on, that perspective on them? His answer was, be a firefighter. So now, that's, not, that's not good news. <laughs> that's not good news. From that's the, not you know, good news. FOP. 
Yeah. And of course, everybody loves a firefighter. And you of know, course, been under scrutiny for quite some time. Yes. You know, I, it's still, you know, you still get a lot of very good, strong candidates applying. I see a lot of great young people coming into the profession. You almost want to say, gee, I'm, I'm so glad you're here. Why are you doing this? Because, you know, it can't be for the money. Right. And I always say that if you give a bunch of police recruits at the police academy a little questionnaire that asks the question, why do you want to become a police officer? And you ask a bunch of first year doctoral candidates in clinical psychology, why do you want to be a clinical psychologist? I think nine out of 10, the answer will be the same. I want to help people. Exactly. Right? Exactly. If right. they want to make big money, they go into business or something else. They want that to help right. people. Every single police academy class that I ever taught, I would always ask on, we called it zero day. Um, why, do you, why did you take this job? To help people. Right. right. And, and they were earnest. It wasn't just they meant it and yeah. they still continue to mean it. That's right. in my experience with yeah. some outliers like Justin Volpe's. And that's before a lot of people's time. But um, that was the Abner Louima incident um in brooklyn with the uh, the plunger in the bathroom the sodomizing the um the oh, I remember. oh yeah oh gee well there you been remember some that? Awful, yeah i do remember that there have been some awful incidents yeah absolutely and so you say that's criminal that's not police yeah. that's not a police officer so um the dean has a second question and this yeah, has yeah. to do with entry level um entry level educational uh question do you have an opinion on entry level educational levels needed? I think um, so kind of like, uh, do we are we are we going to do better if we have folks that have four year degree, two year degree, et cetera, coming into the police department? That's a great question. If you recall, Dr. Larry Massey's dissertation focused on that. Remember, the yeah. looking at education uh, and how that related to internal affair investigations. Remember exactly. that was kind of looking at that relationship. And I exactly. think says, yeah, I mean, it really was a great question to try to address. Um, you know, you would think, you know, the quick answer would be, well, the more educated, the better, right? But does that mean you're nest you might be eliminating some, you know, great candidates who have some terrific life experience, you know, it, but don't have, um, you know, the, what the bachelor's degree or whatever is required. It's a difficult question. I think Dr. Massey found that, well, there was a somewhat a, a moderate correlation between uh, having a, what, being higher educated, I guess, having at least a bachelor's degree and lower internal, lower number of internal affairs investigations. And, you know, you could even, you know, look at that and say, well, you know, is, might some of the people less educated be more actively, you know, more proactive in law enforcement? I mean, I, I, I can't, it's a tough question to answer. It Just is. Just as a rule. Is. Yeah. Is it, gee, what, how can education hurt you? Does that mean you need to have a four year degree, though, to do this job? Well, I'm, you know, a lot of it is yeah. interpersonal skills. Yeah, exactly. I know a lot of doctoral level people who, boy, they the might be great on paper and have good grades and all that. But, you know, how about that interpersonal part? That's so important. Exactly. I mean, I think that what could be accomplished for the street uh, could be accomplished in, in a two year associates uh even yeah, you know just probably. a communications class but yeah. um so did dr uh dennis Hil hibbert Hil hilbert <laughs> just did something on on that one of our uh phd and criminal justice students just defended and his dissertation was on at looking at relationships between education and uh frontline supervisors um uh, oh, and it was very interesting and the same thing kind of like not much of a significant difference um, with education, without education, yes, it's a little helpful. But again, um, it was more than that. More than you know that. what I like though. Some agencies were using. I don't know if that's. I haven't heard about it recently. There is an assessment process called the BPAD. Now I can't tell you what BPAD stands for, but it's essentially a role play test that they would give to new recruits or, or new um, applicants. So it was a series of scenarios that were prearranged and the, the applicant had to respond to those, you know, and they there were different levels of stressful things going on or interactions, things with children or adults, families, whatever it was. And they would record the uh, or observe or record the responses of the applicant. So it was more of a almost kind of a social skills assessment. You know, how do they how are they relating you know, interpersonally, which, gee, I think in this job, that's in that like 95 percent of the job. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, speaking of doctoral students, one of mine is on and I just promoted him to panelist and co-host so he can share. He can come on and he could share his camera with us and he can ask the question. Um, he's also oh, no. an adjunct with us. So, Chris. <laughs> and I think you know him. Oh, yes. Yeah. Hey, Dr. Quite well, that so many years. <laughs> Been a little bit. Yeah. So I wanted to follow up with uh, with the conversation that that you just talked about um, when you were when you were relating to um, that some of some of the officer misconduct. Uh, do you think that some of the officer misconduct could be um, due to repeated exposure to trauma? Yeah. Um, yeah. Certainly. Yeah. Because yeah, we we know that you know trauma affects people in very different ways. Yeah, well, as you know, Chris in particular, and I just wanna say about Chris, he's one of our team leaders for our crisis response team. So he knows a lot about this stuff. Um, but, you know, PTSD, for example, the estimate is that 20, 25% of police officers probably have PTSD as a di diagnosable condition or close to it. Well, you have a whole lot of, a lot of symptoms with that. You have kind of a laundry list of them. We don't have time to go into them now. But if you're affected by, you know, something like that or depression or serious anxiety or you're, you know, you're detoxing from drinking, whatever it is, that's going to affect your conduct. There's no way to avoid that, uh, you know, which is why I think it's so important, A, to prevent those things uh, and B, to assess them uh, where you think there might be a problem and C, to get people help where they need it. And then I have just a little follow up. That's that's great. Um, but the follow up that I have with that um, is that do you think that. Um, the as far as mental health goes and 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 the schism and and debriefing and all that that we should you know focus more attention on the newer officers coming into the business because they very they they're in a very short time they're exposed to stuff stuff that they have never been exposed to in their entire lives right. and hopefully the the compounding factor of that is that you know, if we could teach them how to handle stress, how to uh, be mentally aware of, of, of situations, of problems, how to cope with stuff, that in the future, the, the payoff will be that we're building better officers who may th there again not have or make poor choices and resort to some criminality. Right. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I think this kind of training should start at the level of the academy. You know, that should be part of the academy curriculum. I'll just, as an example, and you're familiar with this, we have our behavioral health training program that we did for our agency a few years back. You know, two hours educational, you know, it, it tackles kind of that big six again that I mentioned, but more from, a, you know, be, be aware of these sorts of things. Uh, and, you know, the fact that they're very young, they often feel invincible or, you know, involved, you know this, this stuff won't happen to them. But I think it's still a great idea to get them very early and to start to educate them about this. Because, you know, to get, as you know, as they get several years into their career, well, you know, things start to change a bit and they, they have to, there has to be some level of sensitivity to possible problems. I, you know, it's unfortunate that, you know, the academies and not just ours, but in you know, most of the country that, you know, they don't spend much time focusing on these things. You know, what is it? Stress management 101 for three or four hours out of five months. Correct. No, that's that's yeah, not going to help. I teach at our police academy. I teach at our police academy, and, there, and there's really there's very limited amount of mental health yeah. going there. But it's more along the lines of recognizing what other people's mental health is. It's right. not what you. It's not what you should be looking for in yourself. Yeah. That's that's what really one of the things that I believe that uh, we 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 can do better. Yeah, and we have to make up the difference then in, in uh, you know our you know an in individual agency, and there's so much variability across agencies. Some really are focused on this. I think you know we do a good job, a pretty good job at ours. Some don't do anything, and then you have some that are really progressive and make a real effort, but that's a relatively small number, I think. Thank you, Doctor V. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Chris. And, Great question. And so now on, see on one spectrum uh, here, we have PhD students. And on another, we have undergrads. And yeah. so I'm going to ask Madison Geller to please come on now. I just promoted you to panelist and uh, and co-host so you can share your camera with us and ask your question. Madison is actually graduating, Dr. Van Hassel. Um, she's she's got quite a story. Um, I'm so impressed with her. 
She's going to be joining the Marines. She's going to be going to officer candidate school. She's a pilot. Wow. Um, she's an amazing individual. And um, so she has a question for you. Sure. And Hi. congratulations, Madison. That's really neat what you're doing. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, my question is kind of similar to uh, what the dean asked earlier. But uh, for, I know we have many uh, undergrad students on here, um, a lot of them looking to go into law enforcement in the future. So knowing like the mental health risks that come with the job, like what advice would you give them? And maybe is there like anything that they can do to like kind of pre like prepare themselves now for like that line of work? Yeah, that's a great question. I'll, I'll tell you, um, I think, um, be, you know, like behavioral health trainings, those types of things that agencies provide are great. But, you know, a lot of it has to do with, uh, let's call it stress management 101, you know, doing healthy things that are good for you physically and mentally and continuing to do those, um, you know, right from the start. Uh, you know, what happens often is people come out of an academy experience and they're in great fit. I think I mentioned this earlier, physical and emotional shape. I mean, they're, they're pretty gung-ho and, and ready to go. But then they they let that go. You know, they don't, they're not as vigilant about that. I think you really have to maintain a level of vigilance across one's career, uh, where even in difficult times, um, you know, you keep pushing and do those things that are healthy for you. Uh, Chris has actually heard me say this when we do the briefings. I always say that there are five S's that uh, are important to be able to process trauma or to prevent trauma. And, you know, one is being able to share or, or talk with other people about things that are happening, you know, that you're experiencing. You don't keep, you know, you don't bottle these things up because uh, we know those who do that are the ones who end up with more problems. Uh, you have a support system that you make use of on a regular basis. You know, don't lose them. You know, keep in touch with people. You know, let them know what's going on with you. The talking part or sharing is really crucial. Uh, you know, if you keep things in that are bothering you, that, that's going to come back to, as we say, bite you later. Um, also, you know, some simple things like, you know, making sure you get proper sleep and don't overdo it with alcohol because that's going to screw up your, the good quality sleep called REM sleep, which is important for processing stress, right? And I always make a point, and uh, Chris has heard me say this many times, uh, you drink heavily, it interferes with REM sleep, it interferes with your ability to process the stress you had from that critical incident, and you're continuing to carry that around. Uh, then uh, the next part is, you know, good physical activity, whatever works for you, May, you know, keeping those going, not stopping when bad times hit, because it's very tempting when you have a critical incident occur to say, well, uh, I won't work out today or tomorrow, I'll wait till I feel better, but you won't feel better unless you get at these things right away and keep them going. All right. So these are just, you know, very basic, straightforward types of uh, suggestions. Uh, the last one I call spirituality, which is not necessarily religiosity, but doing things that keep you centered. Meditation, going to the beach, going to a lake, you know, resting. I mean, you know, just that kind of focus, maintaining the level of equanimity or calmness, very important to do. Uh, but you have to continue to do those throughout your lifetime or throughout your career. You can't stop. And uh, a lot, you know, as Dr. Telesco knows, a lot, well, you know, again, they come through the academy, great, and then things start to decline. Not in everyone, but in, a, in too many of them. Yeah. Thanks, Madison. Anything else? Oh, that's all. Thank you so much. Great question. Thank you. All right. Well, good luck, Madison. That sounds like quite a career you have ahead. Yes, absolutely. I'm so impressed with, with this student. Um, Margo has a question. Hi, looking forward to the discussion tonight. Oh, okay. That was it. Got it. Okay, good. So there really are no other questions that I'm seeing here. Um, you know, Vince, I, I want to say that everything that you've said is, uh, is so right on and, and so important. And I'm so grateful that someone like you exists in the world, uh, and that someone like you is, is assisting effectively you know, our, our police family. Um, so I, I just wanted to say thank you for that. Um, you're, you're not only brilliant and competent, but you're earnest and, and you're just real, you know, you're down to earth, you're real and grounded. And I can see how easy it might be to just talk to you and just tell you what's going on. Um, I know for me, my 20 years was awesome. I mean, I worked, I had, I had my, you know, in the beginning, working in the housing projects uh, of Brooklyn and cops and robbers stuff. And then uh, later on, police academy teacher, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then at the end, 
at the end is what really kind of kicked my butt emotionally. And that was the 9-11 experience, you know, the whole year uh, of working. And it took me a really long time. And I love that you mentioned spirituality here, because I think that that is something that really helped me in terms of my resilience was was my spiritual practice. And so that's uh, I'm glad you mentioned that. It looks like Joey is saying that there's another um, question while I search for it. If you wanted to um, comment on anything I just said, please. Yeah, well, um, first of all, I appreciate your kind words you know, about what I've been doing. Uh, I will just say getting back to the field of police psychology. Um, I kind of half joke with my students that it's really, you know, it's not a job that you can do sitting in an office all day. And, uh, you know, you have to get out and do trainings and teachings and the briefings. Um, you know, there are two groups of police psychologists. One, you know, we call operational, and they're the ones that do get out and do those sorts of things. You know, work with uh, hostage negotiation units, uh, assist investigators in interviewing techniques, uh, those sorts of things. Uh, although you also have the... Um, administrative or assessment side of the, the field. And that's really doing the, the you know, police screenings as well as fitness for duty evaluations. It's very important as well. And there are a lot of police psychologists who just do that. I mean, they're doing testing uh, you know, all day long. That's, you know, that's their job. More power to them. I don't have the patience for that, but mm. uh, you know, it's very important. Uh, and, and if you're doing the therapy or counseling, which is the part that I enjoyed uh, the most uh, anyway, uh, you can't be testing. That's kind of a dual relationship. And if you're testing them, no one's going to trust you or tell you anything. So, right. But they're both very important. Uh, I do have students who've gone on. Uh, one actually recently retired. He was chief psychologist with the U.S. Marshal Service. They started their BAU. Uh, I have another one who's an ASAC up in uh, New York with the F uh, FBI uh, New York City field office. That's assistant special agent in charge. Uh, I have a couple who worked with CIA. Um you know, I've got a bunch of them, you know, all over the country. And uh, yeah, they find it a very exciting line of work. You know, because yeah, it's not your typical thing that psychologists are thought to do. Yes, I have. Um, I have one statement here from Kelly Roth. She wants to thank you for the presentation. She's been a police officer for 24 years and she has a Ph.D. in criminal justice. She teaches at Bloomsburg University in Pennsylvania. Um, uh -huh. Hey, Kelly, they have a fantastic fair, um, the Bloomsburg Fair, which I used to love to go to. Um, she says she's starting another master's in clinical mental health counseling in the fall. And it's great to know others are as concerned about law enforcement, mental health as she is. And Kelly says, yes, it's a great fair. <laughs> so right. let me, I'm going to read Margo, uh, Margo Hallman's question. And then we'll end with Nicole Crimmy's question. So Margo, Margo's saying she had um, an Intel police officer commit suicide this week. She's not going to say the police department out of respect to privacy. She's curious to know if you find that mental health focuses so much on a certain subset of law enforcement, like frontline and first responders, then other subsets like Intel um, administrative divisions. Um, so, where she thinks maybe they end up falling through the cracks. What do you think about that? Well, it's a really good question. Um, and uh, you know, I think I mentioned the Police Executive Research Forum document that came out. It was published in, in was it, 2019. In um, the year 2019, NYPD had from January through October, nine police suicides. Now, they have a lot of officers, but nine is a lot of suicides. And they really, as far as I read and could tell, they came from different levels within the organization. It's everything from, you know, the, I don't I call them the beat cop or the, you know, the man or woman working the street. One was a, a high level, I don't know, major commander with, uh, he was two weeks away from retiring. Oh, my right? God. I, he was my boss. Oh, so you know what I'm, who I'm talking about. I know about. exactly who you're talking about. Um, awful. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, so there's such variation. Um, but what that really suggests to me is that everybody needs to get this kind of thing. It can't just be for the, you know, let's call it the, the troops on the front line who are going out there on patrol. Certainly they're at high risk. But when you think about the higher level and the management people, well, they worked that job, too, before they got into administration. You know, in many cases, many years, everybody needs to get this across levels. And, you know, if you don't have the buy-in from administrators anyway, these programs aren't going to fly. 
see, and that's the thing. It's a buy-in. It's uh, are 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 the um, administrators, the executives, the the frontline supervisors, the lieutenants, etc. Are they are they invested in the mental health of their of their people? And that I think is a big a big thing. Nicole, I just gave you talking privileges. Thank you so much, Dr. Telesco. I first off want to thank you for the presentation, Dr. Rain Hassel, that I really enjoyed it. And so I wanted to ask you, I'm a psychology major and I'm looking into going into um, the forensics side of um, the field. However, I do notice from my research and the literature that I've read that there's a lot of, like you said, um, problems of getting mental health treatment and just including it within the system. So I wanted to ask you, do you think if we start as we look into the future, as we students get into the field, if we look to get police officers and these first responders more access and more education about how to treat themselves, this could be a stepping stone into getting more broader places within the system like correctional facilities and other places within the system to get more involved with the mental health of their workers and the offenders that are within the system. Well, I'm going to get away from offenders. I'm not involved in that part of it, but it's interesting you bring this up. I got a call just yesterday from a psychologist working in one of our larger correctional settings asking if we could apply our peer support training program to corrections down there, you know, where she's working. We haven't done it, but, uh, you know, there's a convinced also, you know, we haven't even talked about corrections. This whole hour could be spent talking about that. Uh, mm -hmm. Also, very high stress line of work, certainly. Uh, so we're going to probably this summer do our peer support for them. But I think in answer to your question, uh, boy, the earlier, I, to me, there's not, there's no such thing as too much information about this. And, you know, again, the young people will say, well, that won't be me, that'll be somebody else. Uh, but, you know, and, <laughs> It, it could be them, you know, and they have to have the awareness and the earlier you can, if, well, you need the awareness and knowledge so you can catch these things early if something is the, you know, becomes a problem before it becomes what we, what we call in psychology crystallized, which means it's been there so, you know, so long and so ingrained, it's very hard to treat or change. <clears throat> the earlier, you know, I, in private practice, I saw, you know, if I see a cop who's had PTSD for 10 years, well, it's treatable, but it's hard. You see someone who really shows the symptoms after a few months. Well, that's sure a lot easier. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much, Nicole. Great, great question. Um, so we're we're out of time. And I want to give you a chance, uh, Dr. Van Hassel, to to speak to the police officers that are out there. If they're watching this, you know, we th this is live streamed. We know exactly who's on right now in the uh, webinar and on the YouTube, but it's recorded. So it keeps playing and it will continue to play. So we never know who's actually going to go to our channel and watch it. So right. what would you say to police officers right now who are struggling silently with the big six? What, yeah. would, you, what would you say to them? Well, get help. Um you know, contact, uh, you know, and there's so much variation in terms of what's available out there, <clears throat> but whether it's through your union, um, through your own agency, you know, find help. Don't wait because these things often don't get better on their own. <clears throat> if you have a, you know, peer support um, people that you can talk to, great. Uh, if you have a chaplain that you, that you like and that you're comfortable with, um, you know, by the same token, if you see something in a colleague of yours that you're concerned about, see something, say something, because the last thing you want is for something very bad that or tragic to happen. And, you know, maybe that could have been stopped. Uh, but, you know, let's make an effort now to really try to fight that old ingrained culture about, you know, not saying anything about, you know, problems that we're having and just sort of biting it and just going ahead and just pushing through as if everything's okay, when in fact it's not. Yes. It's a lot easier to, you know, solve these problems and these uh, issues uh, early. Earlier, you, you know, earlier you can catch them. Like I said just a few minutes ago, the easier they are to treat and change. So, and what about yeah. what about significant others um, who or families that they really see the change? They see the deterioration. Um, right. What would you suggest they do? Well, you know, they can be very helpful in seeking support or getting involved, you know, and really, you know, helping that police officer uh, to, you know, you know, they're going to see it too, and they're going to be impacted as well. 
Yeah, you know, it's hard to keep problems secret, right, for very long. They're going to know that something up, that something is up, and boy, you know, whatever they can do to support efforts to get that cop uh, helper get them started with something, uh, the better. You know, they yes. have to be involved, really. Thank you again. Uh, this won't be the last time that we collaborate. Um, I hope we can get you back next uh, for our next fall season. <laughs> we have a great lineup. Um, thank you again for everything. And I know that, you know, you have a very, very busy schedule. So I really am so, so grateful that you said yes. Well, thank you again. It's a pleasure and an honor for me to be here. And thank you so much for inviting me. And anytime you want me back, uh, I'll, I'll be back. Did you hear that production uh, crew behind the scenes? Uh, write it, write that down. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Van Hassel. And tomorrow, where um, we have so back to back shows, um, I wanted to make sure that we got Dr. Van Hassel, so we did it on a Wednesday. Uh, that was easier for his schedule. And so tomorrow, we have Brevard Sheriff Wayne Ivy is going to talk about the media as a force multiplier. And force multiplier really means uh, kind of like it's almost like a steroid. So, you know, if something is good, they can force multiply that they can they can really enhance that they can expand upon that. Or if something is really bad and negative, they can they can make it worse. So um, Brevard Sheriff Wayne Ivy is going to talk about this tomorrow night. I hope that all of you who are on now will return tomorrow night. And uh, I want to always say thank you to my deans. Thank you to Dr. Durham, Dr. Castro, Dr. Kushner. Uh, they they support everything that we do here. And uh, if you if you love what we what you see, it's because of them. Uh, and I also want to thank Joey Jasinski, Layla Horton. They are my uh, behind the scenes uh, students, my criminal justice students, as well as well as uh, Joey, who is a project manager. So is Layla. And I want to thank both of them uh, for joining and all of our students that have joined. So have a safe night and 